All right, gang, you should be able to hear me now. My apologies. Uh, we're going to go with backup audio tonight, but we're good to go. Welcome to The Last Frame. Tonight, we're going to launch a new feature on The Last Frame, DIY. Yeah, I'm going to go back to my roots with YouTube and all this stuff. Each week, my goal I'm going to feature a DIY piece of gear, maybe a DIY shoot tip, uh, or a DIY hack that you can use to improve your photography and even, of course, save money. And part of this is not just going to be like, hey, here's these cool things that you can do, but I really want to break down the reasoning behind it, right? So we're going to dig into that. And of course, tonight we're still going to do the exclusive Last Frame Photography Q&A. So start typing. If you're here, how can I help you? I'll do my best to answer all of your questions in the next 60 minutes. If you're watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. Drop a comment below the video so that I know you were here already. Got Lynn here from New York. Uh, we got, let's see, Calvin up in Maine, Cooley in Indiana, Joe's here in California, David in San Diego, California, uh, Scott in Arizona, Eric in Connecticut, and I know we got some people squeezing in here. Jay's here from Southern Colorado. All of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I will work really hard to help you with your photography tonight. So, uh, oh, wait, gosh, I can't forget. It would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame. If you could just do me that quick solid, hit the thumbs up down below the video. It's really easy to do. doesn't hurt. doesn't cost you any money. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to go ahead and hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. You can click the share button or you can also share the URL. I just put the link in the chat window to lastframe.live. Twitter, Facebook, they're usually the fastest way to get the word out during the show. So I just have one thing in photo news tonight. And um, if you kind of follow along with what I'm about to tell you and what I'm about to explain, you're going to see kind of the things that I've been talking about over the last couple of weeks and some of the changes that I want to make. Um, and some of the changes that I've been making in my own career, uh, you'll kind of get the point here, right? So many of you know that back in my Nikon days, I used Capture One to tether when I was shooting in the studio, mainly because Lightroom was painfully slow to render an image. And from everything I've heard, I'm not going to lie, I haven't tried it recently, but from everything I've heard, it hasn't gotten a whole lot better. Now, while I was shooting Olympus, I used Olympus Capture software, which, of course, is proprietary to Olympus, super fast to render, like lightning fast. And it was also a great thing because Capture One does not support tethering with uh, Olympus cameras. They'll, they'll work on the files. But, you know, one of the things that I have been finding now that I'm shooting Sony, and I very dutifully, when I you know switched over to Sony, went out and set up a subscription for the what is it, hundred and fifty some dollars a year with Capture One. Great software, not knocking it. But here's what I've been finding in the course of the last year or so using it. I find that I am using the feature set that is built into Capture One less and less and less and less. In other words, I've been using it primarily to tether. And look, I gotta say, if you're using it just to tether, it becomes kind of clunky because there's a lot of features built into that software, great features. But here's the thing, you know, we're never in photography, never. Never's a, never's a tough word, right? We're never gonna have a camera or lens, or any kind of piece of gear, or for that matter, a piece of software, especially not a piece of software, or a computer, or anything like that that is going to be 
forever. We're just not. And that's mainly because all this technology we're using today from um, mirrorless cameras to digital optical lenses to the computers, the software, all of it, it's evolving so rapidly. So look, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that you should be like run out to buy the latest, greatest, newest. God, no. In fact, you know that I push back against that constantly. What I am saying though is pay attention. Be aware. Don't get stuck in the trap of knowing what you know and being comfortable with just what you know. Because that's when things just go by. And it's not even so much that you got to worry about things going by. It's really a matter of when things go by, and I don't mean you have to keep up with the Joneses, but what I do mean is you may be missing out on opportunity to make your work better or even better yet, to make your work easier, faster, more efficient, and even make more money, right? So a couple weeks back, uh, and ironically, my timing was really good. I downloaded, because I was, you know, I was looking for an alternative. I realized, look, I'm paying for Capture One, uh, and, you know, being a bit of a dummy, I paid for, you know, a full year in advance just because... I wasn't paying attention and it was the standard and I knew I didn't want to use Lightroom and I needed to tether with my Sony cameras. So I paid for a year, but realizing that I haven't been using the software and I, I still have a couple months left on my year, but also realizing that in all likelihood, a lot of the other software that's out there for tethering has improved. So one of the most well-known ones is Smart Shooter from Tether Tools, which uh, is up to, well, at the time, was up to version 4, right? So I downloaded that, started the free trial. Actually, it's perfect for what I want. So just yesterday, Tether Tools dropped Smart Shooter 5. And i got to tell you, it's pretty awesome. Now, I have not had an opportunity, full disclosure, to do, you know, a full run through this and, and really speed test it and everything else. I've got it installed, I've got it activated, I've gone through what are the new feature options. Most of the new features are actually not going to benefit me aside from the speed improvements, which that's what I want. For me, that's the number one thing with tethering software. I want something that when I'm shooting in the studio, it is going to render that image really fast. Number one goal. Now, let's put a pin in that for a second because... Look, some of you may be like screaming at the screen saying, but Joe, the raw processing power of Capture One is incredible. Yes, it is. There's no debate. It is probably the most powerful, if not one of the most powerful raw processors that's available in the market. Just like the idea of going out and buying the fastest car. That doesn't mean it's going to be the right car for you. It doesn't mean it's going to be the most comfortable car. It doesn't mean it will be the best transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And that's what Capture One has become for me. And look, I don't make any money here on any of this stuff. Let me be really clear. So I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm sharing my experience. And honestly, what my hope is your takeaway will really be more about the thought process because if you don't tether, then it doesn't matter what software Joe's using, right? And if you do tether, again, the thought process to help you stay on top of what's out there and to help you pay attention to, I don't know, what's going on with the tech. So um, let me go through the, the details here. I, I grabbed the press release from Tether Tools because I still get all the press releases and that um, so let me just kind of give you the breakdown. So with Smart Shooter 5, that's the latest release that they just dropped yesterday, um, it now supports uh, all the Fujifilm cameras, and it adds multi-camera tethering for up to 10 cameras. Now, I'll admit, when I first read that, I'm like, why the hell would I want to tether 10 cameras? The further you get in the release, it totally makes sense. And it's a feature I will probably never have a need for, but there's actually quite a bit of value to the feature. Um, so 
some things to understand about the background of Smart Shooter 5. It's a custom built piece of software, meaning it supports the picture transfer protocol, PTP is what they call it, uh, for each of the various cameras, Canon, Nikon, Sony, um, Canon, Nikon, so now Fuji, okay? Um, what that gives you, more reliable image transfer, faster image transfer for, and, you know, image import, okay? Uh, also, more camera controls, as well as support for a lot more advanced features, okay? And I just got to this part in the press release. I said it before, but now that I know I got it right, Canon, Fuji, Nikon, and Sony cameras, right? Uh, also, Smart Shooter 5 features support for the Apple silicone chips, which is a big deal for people like me. Uh, and it also has enhanced Lightroom plugin support now for Sony, Fuji, and Nikon shooters, plus the ability to do a whole bunch of customizing it. In fact, while I'm talking about it here, let me go up. This is the interface, which you can see it's super simple, super basic, okay? The multi-camera feature that I mentioned, right? So you can connect 10 cameras simultaneously. My first thought was, why? Who would need to do that? But, you know, we live in a world where there are actually quite a few photographers that do a lot of product photography. And when I say do a lot of product photography, I'm talking like Amazon-style product photography, or, or better yet, y'all shop on B&H at some point. So you know on any product on B&H, you can click on it, and then you click on the next picture, and you see the left side, and then the next picture of the right side, and then the next picture of the back, and the next picture of the top, right? So all of those shots, if you're going to do it efficiently, need to be done at the same time. So for photographers specializing in product work like that, they can create a setup with nice, even lighting, set up multiple cameras, and in one click, shoot all the various angles that they need to do. Because using software like this, you can trigger it via the software or via um, a remote trigger, whatever is easiest, whichever you prefer. Um, you can even group cameras together and run groups of like two and then run scripts. Um, extremely customizable. You can even set up up to four cameras at a time in the live view, right? So pretty cool stuff. It also has a new workspaces feature, which means basically you can kind of create customized views. So for different types of shooting that you're doing, you can set up customized views that are going to help you be able to, um, you know, work through things faster and more efficiently. Also, it has support for high resolution screens. Um, and they're also now using QR and barcoding with the software, which is another one of the things. My first thought was, why do I need QR and barcoding? But here's the thing, right? I already mentioned products, but if you're doing uh, portraits, basically any kind of bulk photography, the ability to save information to image individual image files, uh, updating metadata on capture is going to make it a lot easier to manage those kind of shoots. This has the ability to manage that. Also, expanded file saving options, uh, a smart save that lets you save folder uh, images to multiple folders in multiple locations all at once. And it's 99 bucks for a per, uh, perpetual, there's the word, perpetual license for one camera. And then if you want to add, and by the way, you can put that on the three computers. If you're going to add um, cameras, it's an additional $99 per camera if you're doing the multi stuff, right? So uh, let me go ahead and share the link here. I should have the link. Let me grab that link for you guys. I'll put it in. It's also in the description below the video. Next week, when we come back, I will give you a first-hand breakdown and I'll record some actual shooting scenarios so that you can see how fast the image transfer is. But for me, going back to the Capture One piece, right? Uh, the thing for me was simply realizing, like, yes, Capture One's been a standard, but Adobe ACR, and you guys have heard me talk recently quite a bit about Adobe ACR and how excited I am about so many of the upgrades that Adobe is putting in. Plus, admittedly, I'm using the new Photoshop. Well, I shouldn't say new, but I'm using Photoshop beta 
which also includes a lot more of the AI features like generative fill, all that kind of stuff. Um, features that Adobe has right now in ACR cover my needs. And that's the key piece. So having a more expensive, more in-depth, slightly harder to learn software, I won't say it's harder to use because once you learn it, if you really take the time to learn it, it's not hard, but there's a lot more going on there. So it's got a steeper learning curve. Having all that does not make my pictures any better. Adobe ACR is software that I've been using for, God, 26 years now. Well, Adobe Photoshop for 26 plus years. I am super comfortable with it. I am very familiar with it because I do lots of compositing and things like that. I still need to use it. So it actually simplifies my workflow. Software like Smart Shooter, it's basically my connectivity piece. So I'm really using Smart Shooter as an extension of my camera, connecting it to a computer, and it's allowing me to set up the settings on the camera, even control the camera, download my files, distribute them to where I need them, rename them as needed, all that cool stuff. And then I'm still doing my processing in Photoshop, which also you can do it in Lightroom if you want. So food for thought. Uh, it's a, like I said, a recent kind of change slash update, if you will, that I've made. Uh, very happy with it and really looking forward to kind of, again, simplifying things. All this new tech that we have is outstanding but it's really easy to get in a little bit over your head with all of the tech. So as the tech improves and things kind of, the dust settles down, it's always worth looking to see what's gonna be the path of least resistance for me to be able to do what I actually really want to do and need to do, all right? So I promised you a new feature tonight and that new feature is D. I Y. So here's the thing. Number one, this is going to be a weekly feature. Each week, I'm either going to share a DIY piece of gear, kind of a how to make it, or a DIY shooting tip, or a DIY hack. Every week, there will be something. Okay. Um, also, starting next week, and actually, I'll be kicking this off in my Tog Knowledge community tomorrow night during our weekly community meetup. Starting next week, you'll have the opportunity to be able to submit your own DIY hacks, share them with the photography world, and win prizes. If I use a DIY hack of yours that is submitted, you will receive a prize. First set of prizes that I have coming up, a full year's subscription to Luminar Neo from Skylum. So more about that next week. If you're part of my Todd Knowledge community, you'll find out about it tomorrow and you'll have a week's head start to get into the competition to, uh, I, I hate to call it competition because we're sharing, right? But I guess that's what it is because you have a chance to win some cool stuff and I have some other prizes coming down the pike. So, as I've been talking about a lot recently, I'm kind of taking a step back. Taking a step back and honestly getting back to basics. And as you're seeing, this is why I wanted to share and why I took so much time about the Smart Shooter uh, and Capture One. I'm realizing just in my own work that it's time to take a step back from some things and simplify. In the last 23 years of digital technology or 22 and a half years of digital technology, we have seen such incredible stuff come out. And for the longest while, I used this, and this is kind of what made me fairly popular on YouTube back in the day, 2009, 2010, 2011. I used the philosophy of, listen, here's this cool piece of gear. I'd love to have it. Who doesn't want cool gear? But the real question is, do I need it? Meaning, how often am I actually going to use it? What kind of impact is it going to have on my work? Specifically, the concept that I have in mind, but also my work in general. 
That's a smart approach to take for several reasons. One of which, if you're ever trying to make money, you've got to hold yourself accountable to your gear expenditures because every one of those gear expenditures impacts the bottom line. If you're just buying every piece of gear that's coming out there, that's great. You got a lot of toys, but man, you better be making some bank because otherwise you're not making profit. So for years, I did lots of DIY stuff and then started sharing them on YouTube and admittedly kind of got away from it in part, as I've explained in the last few weeks, because I got to this point where companies were handing me stuff left and right. And, you know, that's cool at first. It's addictive at first. But then you also realize you basically are a salesperson for those companies. And, and look, um, just to be clear, and I want to keep it real, understand, you know, when you think of the influencers that you like. And look, we all like certain influencers. But please understand, and, and I was guilty of doing this, gang, right? An influencer is a salesperson. That is your job. That is the role. That is why they are an influencer, right? Simply is. So all of that being said, that's a big part of why I stepped away from it. So the DIY stuff. Tonight, the first one I'm going to share with you, I talked about this publicly. I've talked about it in bits actually on here, pieces of it. But I talked about this, this whole piece uh, publicly in a class that I did a few weeks back called Shoot Prep. And a lot of people went nuts over it, had a lot of questions. Everything I'm about to show you, but for one piece, and I'll explain why, you can find links underneath the video in the description. All of them are Amazon links. They are all affiliate links. If you buy anything, I will make a couple pennies that help support the work that I do here on the channel. But that's not why they're there. That's where I bought them, literally, okay? So this is what I'm sharing with you tonight. Now, this actual case that you see, this is the piece that is not linked underneath the video. The reason why, when I started this DIY concept, this was a perfect case for it. Now, it's not quite big enough. I don't want a big one. I need one that's just a little bit bigger. And honestly, I haven't found it yet. I haven't found exactly what I'm looking for. So, and by the way, the most important stuff is what's in this and why you should consider having this. And what I've got here is something that pretty much anyone that photographs people, unless you're a street shooter, right? Street shooter, this is probably not gonna apply to you. But if you do events, if you do weddings especially, if you do portraits, if you photograph models, everything that's in here has tremendous value to your workflow. So I would refer to this as a styling kit, for lack of a better phrase. I mean, it really, it, it covers a lot of kind of different categories, if you will, okay? Bear with me one second here. I just also want to make sure that I am, yeah, good. I'm, I'm on the right set of images that are going to come up here. So this little bag, before I switch my screen over and show you the various pieces, I travel with this. So you know that I travel and teach. And of course, I also work in my studio here. But what I love about this thing is I can open this up and kind of like a travel kit for toiletries, it has a hook in it. And so I can hang it. And literally, I usually hang it on the light stand for my key or main light, right? Because that's a stand that's usually gonna be within arm's reach of me when I'm working on a set. So that's gonna be hanging there, right? Now, what's inside this thing? That's the stuff that I wanna go through and I wanna show you what that's all about. So. I'm going to switch over here, uh, change screens. And the first thing that's in here, let me just go ahead and grab one of these to show you. And you can see the picture. These are oil absorbing sheets. Every one of you, if you photograph people, 
has encountered a situation where you are floating, and look, it's the perfect time of year, especially if you're in North America. You know, it's summertime, it's hot outside, and your subject is shiny. Uh, if you're photographing people of color, it doesn't matter what time of year it is, it's the slightest little bit of shine on their skin is potentially going to cause you problems with your lighting. Now, let's be clear. There are two ways to solve that problem. Well, excuse me, three ways to solve that problem. This is just one of them, but that's why you want to have these with you. And these are, you know, specifically uh, made up of bamboo and charcoal. When you first pull them out, they kind of look like a cross between a Kleenex tissue and a piece of lens cleaner. It's got kind of a very odd texture in between, but that's the point. Really, really good at absorbing moisture. I don't know if you guys can actually see, but even just in that little, you know, let's see if it'll, in that little blot, it picks up a lot of moisture really, really quickly. And I'm not sweating. I'm not shiny. Okay. So, um, Here's the trick to using these. You blot. You saw when I used it? I blotted. You don't wipe. Nothing like that. I don't care if the person's dripping. You don't wipe. You blot, right? Always blot. Um, these are good to have whether you're working with a makeup artist or not. And actually, I got ahead of myself. All the things that are in this kit... Probably 80% of what I'm going to show you, most makeup artists will have with them in their kit. But don't assume that they do. And look, you and I both know the reality that plenty of times you're photographing somebody for a portrait, for a business portrait, and there's no makeup artist involved. Even though that would make your work better, there's no makeup artist involved. So this kind of stuff extremely valuable, very helpful. Again, the links to every one of these things in the description below the video to the actual products that I'm showing you, which are the actual products that I use. And I do, I purchase all of them on Amazon, okay? So next on my list of things here that I have for you, let me just get my whole list back here so we can get back, is Lumify. So this stuff for years, actually, I don't know where my bottle is, but you can see the picture. For years, I would use um, Visine because it gets the red out. And that's the whole point. Those of you that work with models, those of you that do portraits, you have had plenty of scenarios where a model or a person having a portrait done walks in the door and before they're even five feet in the door, they're basically whining about how tired they are because they were up late the night before, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look, when that's a paying client, they're just stupid. When it's a model, they're an idiot because they should know better. They've got to take care of themselves. But the fact of the matter is people don't. So, Visine did pretty good, but this Lumify, this is a newer product that works super, super fast and has no allergic issues that they report or that I've come across. I will tell you a couple of things about this. Number one, you should always ask before using it. Like you're not just going to go up to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to put this in your eyes, get rid of it. You know, it's a conversation you need to have with someone. Uh, I will admit whenever possible, I am going to have my makeup artist do it. I don't wish to do it. But the other important piece is don't give it to your subject to do it. It's important that you keep the bottle clean. If the person makes a mistake and taps their eye or their eyelid or even their eyelashes hit it, you really should be tossing it because you can't properly clean it without messing the stuff up then, right? So it's super, super, it's no different than when you go to the eye doctor, right? They put the drops in your eyes and then they put the bottle right back in the rack. But the tech is very careful not to let that touch your eye or your eyelashes. That's the point, right? And they still wipe it off before they put it down. But this stuff works really, really well. If you have a person that you've got to photograph and if you've ever tried retouching, bloodshot lines and that kind of stuff out of the eye. Yeah, it's doable, but it's wasted time. It takes you a lot less time 
put a couple drops in somebody's eyes than it does to have to retouch that stuff after the fact. Okay. Next item, two things here. One, I like to call it a Chinese torture device, um, but really what it is is an eyelash curler. And here, let me pull this out so that you can see um, a better view of it. So that's an eyelash curler. I am not doing mine. In fact, actually, I'm about to clip one in here um, so it doesn't open at the moment. Why are these important? Well, these are important in combination with the yellow swabs that you see there, which is not really a swab. They're little disposable brushes. They are eyelash brushes. Now, there's a couple things that you want to do to eyes in every picture. And this isn't just if you're working with some model with lots of makeup on. This is even if you're doing a regular portrait of someone. And if you want my honest advice, gang, even if you're photographing a male, I don't care if it's a mature male, my age or older, you still want to do this part. So let's assume there's makeup. We'll start there, all right? And then we'll do this part last for now. Um, if the woman uses mascara, mascara that is not high-end mascara like a makeup artist uses. And by the way, not every makeup artist uses good mascara. Just saying. I've had some really bad experiences with makeup artists using junk mascara. What makes it junk? Two things. Clumps and flakes. Clumps, meaning if you look really close at the eyelashes, you can literally see clumps of mascara all over the eyelash. Flakes, meaning it doesn't actually stick well to the eyelashes, and you get little tiny black specks all over the cheeks, which you've got to retouch them too. The reason for using this, and I use this whether I'm working with a makeup artist or whether I have a subject doing their own makeup, the very last thing that I want them to do when they come on the set is I want them to run this through their eyelashes. Real or fake, it doesn't matter. I want them to run this through. What it's going to do for me is two things. It is going to remove clumps. It won't get rid of every single clump, but it'll get rid of a lot of them. And it is going to eliminate eyelashes from being crisscrossed and going in all different directions. Which if you shoot a nice close-up of that person and their eyelashes are going all over the place, it just looks sloppy. So that's saving me having to do tons of Photoshop work where I'm going to like replace entire sets of eyelashes, which I've done because of sloppiness, right? If you notice that the subject already has some clumps of mascara underneath their eyes before you do this, take one of these blotting tissues, lay it across the top of the cheek, and then do it. Again, don't smudge. Just set it there, do that, take it off, go to the other side, etc. That's how you use it. So, and then you dispose of this. These are super cheap. Uh, I buy them, I think it's like 300 at a time and they're less than 10 bucks. Super cheap, right? And then you just dispose of them afterwards, okay? Um, why is the curler a big deal? So, especially if you're working with models, a lot of young women that model, they will want to go ahead and put false eyelashes on to get more pop out of their eyes. That's cool. I actually like false eyelashes as long as they're not overdone, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I want, hopefully, to have the illusion of it looking real. So here's the problem. Generally, the reason why these women want to wear eyelashes in the first place, it's one of two things or a combination of the two. Either their eyelashes, their own eyelashes are not very long, or their own eyelashes don't curl very well and they tend to come out somewhat straight, as I said before, or a combination of the two. So the problem is when they put false eyelashes on, if you shoot a close-up, and, and keep in mind, look at how many of my images are close, close, close-ups, right? The problem that you run into is that in a close-up shot, you can see the two different sets of eyelashes. That's not the idea. The idea with false eyelashes is for them to make it look like you have amazing eyelashes. 
So number one, these little brushes come in handy to blend them together. But then number two, it's using the Chinese torture device to, uh, it's actually this way, okay, to curl them so that they blend together and curl together. Also, some other little tips. If your subject, doesn't matter if it's a portrait subject, doesn't matter if it's a model, whatever, especially if you're working with a makeup artist even. If your subject has never worn false eyelashes before, and ladies, you can attest to this for me, they will feel like their eyelids are much heavier than they normally are, even though the false eyelashes weigh nothing. It's just, it's a psychological thing. Especially if the eyelashes are too long, you'll find that you suddenly have not made the eyes look better because the eyes are actually smaller now. If you're lighting really close and high, you'll be creating shadows underneath the false eyelashes, none of which look good. So number one, false eyelashes, don't put your lights right above, back off a little bit so you're coming under the eyelashes. Number two, curl them. And what I have my makeup artists do or my subjects if they're doing their own, I tell them to over curl. Anytime you curl eyelashes, they will start to relax. Always. They always do. False ones, real ones. They will start to relax. And it's not like you can put hairspray on them. That's not a good idea, right? So I have them over curl them so that I get that nice pop. Because really, what do we want for the picture? We want to see those eyelashes against the eyelid. That way, they actually stand out. If the eyelashes are all straight down here, they all kind of blend in, and all that extra work is for nothing, right? So we want them to curl up nice and big, which gives the impression of opening the eyes up. So eyelash curler, super, super important. Next in my bag, these are super important, clips, all kind of clips, clips and clamps, right? So the ones that I use a lot of are these little tiny hair clips, which are the ones that you see in the picture. I don't know if I can actually get the camera to focus on this or not. Let's see if I can. There we go. So that's, you know, they're the little tiny hair clips that you can use for like ponytails and things like that. But these are also great for clipping material when I'm doing styling and things like that. Even if you've got to clip a shirt back or tighten a collar, these can work well. They don't have a ton of strength, but they have just enough. And you'll notice uh, on the left on the picture that's over there, whoops, <laughs> over there, sorry, um, there's even smaller ones that I use. And just regular hairpins, also very helpful, both for hair and for material, clipping clothing, etc. All that stuff, super, super valuable. Uh, I've got probably uh, 10 each of those clips that you're seeing in that picture in this little back. They don't take up a lot of space, which is the best part, right? Um, for hair products, this stuff is amazing. This is relatively new on the market. It's called Flash Moment. Uh, it looks like mascara. In fact, um, if you look right behind the logo and the picture over there, over there, my gosh, over there, um, you can see it's got like a mascara brush to it that you slide out. But what this has in the tube is an undiluted glycerin, which acts as a hairstyling gel. So if you have flyaways all in the face, flyaways that are sticking up and your lights lighten those flyaways up and they just look like Beetlejuice, like craziness going on, this stuff is great. You don't have to be a hairstylist. You take this and you just comb it through the flyaways and it presses the flyaways down. Super simple doesn't dry out and get hard like some styling hairsprays will. Um, it does come out of the tube a little bit heavy, so whenever you put it on, you're going to brush it through, brush it through, brush it through. Don't leave the excess there. If you just like hit it once, you're probably going to leave some excess. So brush it through. Works amazing. Uh, this would be great. I know I've got some wedding people here that are watching. This stuff is you know great to stick in your pocket if you've got a bride that's just having a bad hair day or it's a humid day now that it's summertime and the hair's starting to frizz. This stuff will do wonders when you've got to do like a close-up portrait of her and, and the groom. You know, very, 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 very helpful. Okay. Next up in my kit, 
Hair bands and rubber bands. Can't stress that enough. Uh, I have a little thing that I got that's got, just like you've seen the picture, it's got black, brown, beige, gray, and blue hair bands. Uh, trust me, I've used these for everything from hair to outfits to uh, creating style pieces by stacking a whole bunch of them, like for a ponytail, all kinds of stuff. And then the little tiny rubber bands are actually kids' hair size rubber bands. are super, super small. Again, they come in super helpful for doing lots of crazy things with hair. Even, you know, a lot of times when I'm doing my material wraps and things like that, I just need to get bits of hair out of the way so I can grab it and twist it up in one of those rubber bands and I'm going to cover it with material, right, which works great. And they take up, again, no space, okay? Rat tail combs. I always I used to call these pick combs, but when I look them up, it turns out they're called rat tail combs. Um, you can get plastic ones like this, which are the ones that I prefer, or you can get ones that have a metal uh, rat tail to it, which is really, really thin. I don't use these for brushing or combing hair. No. I use the tail. The tail is great for being able to reach in and move hair off your subject's face much more effectively than you can with your finger, right? Obviously, you need to be very careful that you don't poke somebody's eye out in the process. But here's the other way to use it. And I apologize, I did not bring my hairspray up. I'm going to show you what hairspray I would recommend in a few minutes. But uh, what I will do also for flyaways, or let's say that I've got hair that's sliding down on the face. All of you run into that problem where maybe there's a bang that keeps dropping or the hair keeps sliding forward. You take one of these rat tail combs and you spray hairspray all over the tail. And then you wipe it down to push back. So you just kind of stick it in and drag it along and hold it at the bottom where you want the hair to rest to give it a, give the hairspray a chance to set. And it works wonderfully. The mistake that so many people make is they'll just, you know, kind of hold their hand there so you don't spray in the person's face. And then they spray and spray and spray and spray tons of hairspray. The problem with that is you're using a lot more hairspray than necessary. You're running the risk of getting hairspray on the makeup, on the face, on clothing. Uh, you put too much of it on, you're going to start to change the texture of the hair. And it's not going to look natural because the hairspray will do that. So by actually spraying it on the rat tail and then dragging it through works wonders. Okay? Aquanet. Women that are watching and any makeup artists, they tend to cringe when they see this. And I have converted quite a few makeup artists and hairstylists along the way. Here's the thing. Aquanet has been around, I think, since like the 1950s, if I'm not mistaken. I know my mother used this stuff when I was a kid. You can still get it if you go into, you know, Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, any of those, even like Walmart, Target. They have it. It's down on the bottom shelf, right? And you'll find just one facing of it, okay? But they have it. It's really cheap. Why is it so good for photo shoots? So number one, it's much, much less inexpensive than salon quality hairspray. Number two, it's so great for photo shoots because it's really not very good. Meaning, you could spray a half a can of hairspray into somebody's hair. It's only going to hold for about 15 or 20 minutes before that all starts to drop. But then the beauty of it is, is you can brush it right out and it's like the hairspray was never there. With salon quality hairspray, the problem that you run into is that the more you use, the more the hair kind of starts to turn into helmet head. And it also starts to change the texture and it changes the reflectivity of the hair. So if you're using rim lights or hair lights, it starts to mess with your lighting. Aquanet, cheap, simple, and you can do multiple hairstyles, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and you're just brushing it out in between. That's what makes it so great to work with, okay? Uh, more clips and clamps. I showed you the baby ones before. These are the bigger ones. These guys, I have tons of these. In fact, when I'm working on a styling shot, these are the ones that you see on the left in the photo. Um, when I'm working on a shot in the studio where I'm using materials and stuff like that, I usually take about 10 or 15 of these and I clip them to the bottom of my shirt before I start working on this set. 
that way I've got them handy, right? And not just the ones that I travel with in this little bag, but I have bags of them sitting on my work cart in my studio. These are great. They're super, super strong, and they're also super, super small, so they're easy to hide. If you need something that's a little bit bigger with a little bit more grip and also strength, these plastic ones, uh, I think these are like three inches, if I'm not mistaken. They work great. And it's also a good idea to have a couple of the big ones, like the six-inch clamps. Obviously, these are much, much heavier, so they've got a little bit more limited use. But believe me, there have been plenty of times that these have, you know, really kind of saved my butt uh, in a shoot because I maybe I had a lot of material or that that I was trying to um, get to do what I needed, and I was able to use this in the back and also use it kind of as a counterweight for the material. So lots of clips of uh, various shapes, sizes, super super important okay um a couple things since i'm on this topic so that's all the stuff by the way that's in the bag that's it a couple other things though that depending on what you shoot and how you shoot and where you shoot will save your butt down the road so in my studio i do have a dedicated makeup area with actual kitchen cabinets and a work counter right and i maintain drawers with a lot of supplies for my subjects and makeup artists like the kind of stuff that I've been showing you, but I always have spare sets of um, glue-on fingernails and the good kind of fingernail glue. Frequently, the fingernail glue that comes in these sets, these sets are inexpensive. It's less than $5 for like three sets of nails, okay? Um, the glue that comes in the sets oftentimes is junk. It doesn't work really well. It's kind of the same situation also with uh, false eyelashes. If you buy inexpensive false eyelashes, the glue tends to suck. So if you're going to do that, buy a bottle of the good eyelash glue and keep that at your studio or keep it in your travel kit so you have the good stuff, right? Um, but these have saved me in more than one occasion where somebody has ignored the directions to make sure their nails were clear coat or French tipped as you see in these nails right there. Um, and they're super inexpensive, so it's worth having some around. And then the last one uh, that I'll show you for tonight, since we have all that stuff that we're putting goop in that on the face, um, is makeup wipes. Makeup artists will always have them, or at least they should have them. Uh, most women will come with makeup wipes if they're planning on doing makeup at your studio, but never assume, right? Um, you know, if something happens, something gets smudged, and it goes like, well, but I have more foundation. I can put foundation on. She's going to need to clean that space before she does it. She may not have brought makeup wipes. So uh, have some there. What I've started using and what's linked in the description, this particular package is not what's linked in the description. What's linked in the description, I just started using them about a month ago, and I didn't have a picture of them. I'm sorry. But they are single-use packets which is great because I can throw three or four of them in this case or in this bag. I even have some in my camera bags. Um, and in a pinch, I can use them as wet wipes to clean my glasses. I can use them for a lot of different things, right? So they're single use and then you toss them. So that is this week's DIY. So for those of you that shoot people, it's some hacks that are going to save you time save you a lot of energy, help you do some of the things that you need to do, and most importantly, make your subjects look amazing. Believe me, the biggest ones out of there, the eyelash brushes, the hair gel in the mascara brush, uh, and the uh, blotting papers. Those are the kinds of things that are just super valuable. Um, they will save you tons of time, and they will save you... Uh, tons of retouching and so obviously gang and and by the way uh what i'm also going to begin doing by friday of this week there will be an article keep an eye on my social media there will be an article uh that i will post on my blog i'm gonna do also a printed article series of all these diy hacks as we go forward so there will be an article all about this with all the information including the links you've already got the links they're there but it's going to break it down for you, tell you a little bit more about it. And 
it will essentially come with a warning. I shouldn't say a warning, but a clarification. And, and so this is going to be an ongoing thing, right? My goal with these things is for this to be a two-way exchange of information. Literally, two-way exchange. Look, if you've been taking pictures for six months, you've got some hacks. You've got some things that you have found make your job easier, help you get the results that you want, save you some money. Please don't think that because you've only been shooting for six months, your hacks don't hold value. And here's why. And I, I'm not, I do not mean to sound cocky that, about this. This is a statement of fact. Remember, I've been taking pictures for 52 years at this point. It's a long time. Meaning I've forgotten a lot more than you've probably learned in six months. Your simple hack that you think, oh, everybody must know this. In all likelihood, is going to remind me of something. It may remind me of that exact hack, or it may remind me of some other similar hack that I can share back. So when I share out the link to the form next week, or if you're in my Tog Knowledge community tomorrow night, um, please don't think that your hacks have no value, because they do. My goal is we're going to create a channel on my website of articles. There will be the series of last frames every week. Some will be shorter. Some will be longer. Some will be more detailed. Some will be really simple. It's like, here it is. This one thing, for this reason, boom, done, right? But we're going to create a repository of all of these hacks. And why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because one of the big mistakes that photographers make, and you notice I said photographers. So I'm talking about amateurs. I'm talking about professionals. I'm talking about me. We see new gear. We see gear that does things that our existing gear doesn't do. We see new gear. Sometimes it just looks cool or it works in a slightly different way. And we think, oh my God, I want that. Right? This is a hobby or a profession, either or, where it is really, really easy to overspend. Plain and simple. And look, I'm not being cheap. I like cool stuff. But it's really easy to overspend. So my goal, by trying to create this kind of repository of solutions and hacks and tips, is so that you have it as a reference so that the industry has it as a reference to be able to go back to and find ways to do things when they need to do something that is kind of a one-off, if you will. Because for professional photographers, the way you look at gear, if, if you're smart and if you want to make money, really make money, you know, anytime you're looking at gear, you have to ask yourself, what is the real return on the investment here? Is this a piece of gear that I just really want it because it's new and it's cool? Or is it really going to make a difference in my photography? That's the key. No difference than, you know, I'm shooting with the Sony a7IV. It's not the a7Vs. Because they're not going to make a difference in my photography. They're great cameras. Awesome upgrade. But they're not going to make a difference in my photography. Even in the studio. I shoot with the a7R4, not the a7R5. Because it's not going to make a difference in my photography. So I can't justify it. Right. So for me, before I wound up going down that path of being an influencer and having people send all kind of stuff, DIY actually evolved for me as really kind of a necessity. It was for those times where I wanted to do something that was very different or very unique, but didn't want to spend the money for a real piece of gear. That's where DIY made the most sense and saved me not only tons of money, but here's the other cool piece. Because oftentimes while DIYing a piece of gear, you won't be able to match the expensive paid version exactly. That also means you'll come up with a result that's slightly different. And there's one of those words that you all know I love. 
different, right? I don't want my work to look like everybody else's. That's why you can go through my YouTube channel, back through my tutorials, and you'll even see uh, a video on how I use dog toys to make lighting gobos for backgrounds. And they're really cool, right? So, so that's the idea. And that's a DIY piece, by the way. And I should let you all know, in fact, here, let me bring my YouTube channel up. For those of you that maybe haven't been following me that long, uh, there are a whole bunch of DIY videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, bear with me one second, and I will show you how to find them. Let's uh, switch over to that browser. Good. So if you go, to, um, actually, I'll get you the URL for the whole thing. If you go to the YouTube channel and you scroll down, there is uh, photography equipment, DIY, do-it-yourself, all kind of little hacks, tips, tricks, a uh, bunch of them there. And by the way, some of these we will revisit because as you know, you'll see right on the box on that page, some of them are three, four, five years old. Um, as technology has advanced, there are some newer, simpler, easier solutions, etc. cetera. Uh, so a few of those I will revisit um, and dig into again, but they will be updated um, with kind of new ideas, new, new twists, if you will. All right, so let's see here. A um, couple of questions, because I'm, of course, going to run over time. That's a shocker, right? Uh, Cooley asked, uh, Joe, are you going to be getting the wireless setup for Tether Tools? No, um, and here's why. It's real simple. Their wireless setup is great, um, but it relies on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is currently too slow, um, and th th Wi-Fi is the bottleneck. It's not the software. It's not the wireless setup. It's the wi the current Wi-Fi standards. It just takes too long, right? Um, possibly once Wi-Fi 6 becomes the norm, and that's also built into the cameras, et cetera, et cetera, then that may be something I'll consider if, if that's fast enough. But keep in mind, Cooley, when I'm in the studio, uh, I'm shooting 61 megapixels, right, with the A7R4A. Um, and wireless that would take forever uh at this point uh coolly do they still make p22 panels i'm not sure what a p22 panel is uh if you can type fast give me a little bit more information there uh am i just having a brain fart about what a p22 is should i know that one i'm sorry uh yeah give me a little bit more detail and i will try to help you out um, let me just see you're scrolling back. Oh, Cooley asks, what would I need to bring to the workshop? You, a strong desire to learn, and um, your camera, and uh, appropriate lens, meaning short to medium length telephoto lens. That's it. Um, you don't bring lighting gear, obviously, we'll, the model. So uh, Cooley's question was a follow-up to a little message I had posted before we started tonight, gang. Um, a bunch of you have asked me if I'm ever going to do in-person workshops again in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in my studio. Um, and I've been holding off and holding off and holding off, obviously, through the pandemic. That was a no-go. But the answer is yes. I'm looking at putting one together for the end of August um, and then possibly another one in the fall. But probably it's going to be the end of August and then not until next year. Uh, we'll see, you know, see what the response is and what the demand is on it. Um, the one for the end of August, in all likelihood, um, I will work with my makeup artist slash model, whom you have all seen in uh, so many of my pictures. Let me just uh, here. I'll show you who I'm talking about. Uh, her name is Monet. Um, she's in a bunch of my videos. Um, let's just see here. It's got to be yeah. So. This is one shot of Monet there. So she will likely be um, the model and makeup artist for uh, the event. That's her. Um, that's her there. So we're in the process of kind of uh, working up details and all that kind of stuff. Fortunately, I'm, I'm in a, um, a location here in Allentown that 
is well served by both airports and all the major hotel chains. Uh, I'm literally like 15 minutes from an international airport. Uh, all the major hotel chains are here, so um, it's it's very easy access. I've done them in the past, uh, just haven't done them since um, the pandemic, you know, came along. Uh, Cooley said the P22s were reflective panels. I'm not familiar with them, Cooley. I'm sorry. Uh, so they may, I would, you know, hit a Google search and, um, you know, see what you can come up with. Okay. All right, gang. So we're out of time. Shocker. I talk a lot. Thank you for watching. I, sincerely, I hope that you found some value in what I shared with you tonight. Um, please remember hitting a thumbs up helps other people find out about the show and obviously follow me on socials in general helps me get the word out and helps me get a little bit more traction but please remember sincerely you you don't get back the days that you waste so go pick up your camera and shoot something because your best shot it's your next shot do the work gang adios take care now